Uh, hello, everybody. Hi, uh, for those of you still getting food, uh, please go ahead and uh, no rush or anything, but we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Gabriel Wilgen. I'm the co-president of the Harvard Animal Law Society. Uh, and on behalf of our board and on behalf of our co-sponsors, uh, the Animal Law and Policy Society um, and the Women's Law Society, uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, it's a really great attendance. Uh, we've had great attendance all week, and it's uh, always so uh, gratifying to see so many people interested in protecting animals and animal law. Um, this one, before we get to introducing our speaker today, Kitty Block, uh, I'd like to just let you know that tomorrow is our last day of our successful Animal Law Week. Um, we're going to be having a panel discussion on uh, accelerating alternatives to animal testing and science. I think it'll be a really fascinating and important discussion, so I hope you can all make it out. It will always be free food, uh, as, as all of our talks have, so uh, please do come by. Um, and now it's really an honor to introduce to you our speaker for, for today, uh, Kitty Block, who is the President and CEO of Humane Society of the United States and uh, Humane Society International, uh, an organization I worked for for several years before coming to law school. And I just uh, put in a plug for them. If any of you are interested in interning with HSUS or HSI, I highly recommend it. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering, donating, it's an excellent organization doing uh, amazing work for animals uh, across the world and here in the US. Um, a, bit, a bit about Kitty. Um, she joined HSUS in 1992 as a legal investigator. Uh, her efforts there uh, led to many different victories for animals. Um, some real landmark ones were a European Union bans and United States bans on cosmetic, or sorry, not cosmetic testing, um, on uh, the import of dog and cat fur. We'll get there on the cosmetic testing. Yeah. Just this close. This, this, she's done a lot for a lot, a lot of things for animals. But uh, the import of dog and cat fur uh, into the EU and, uh, and uh, into the United States and the ban of slaughtering horses for human consumption. Uh, for a lot of her career, she's focused especially on protecting whales and dolphins and other wildlife. Uh, she worked on, uh, she led uh, litigation efforts that were successful to protect uh, dolphins and uh, for uh, tuna, uh, for uh, dolphin safe tuna legislation. Um, Block has also testified before the US Congress, uh, sorry, Kitty has testified before the US Congress, uh, worked with international governments, um, and other agencies uh, for a wide range of animal protection laws and conservation laws uh, that have uh, impacted millions of animals across the world. And she's built coalitions with uh, NGOs and industry. Uh, and she's also served as an advisor to the White House on trade and environment. Uh, so um, I know we're all very excited to hear what she has to say. So without further ado, please welcome Kitty Block. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me today. And please leave some food. I'm getting here afterwards. <laughs> um, it's really great to be here. I'm actually from this area. I uh, grew up in Nahant, which is just about 30 minutes north of here. And so I've always uh, walked by this area and just been in awe of what was happening inside these walls. And um, I couldn't be more thrilled about the growing commitment to animal uh, protection work uh, in the school. And, and it's just. It's so important, when I went to law school, so I went to law school, dear God, how long ago now? So I graduated in 1990, and there really wasn't anything like this, nothing. And I tried to take a few environmental law classes, thinking there may just be something in there, um, but nothing really. So this is so incredibly exciting for me, um, you know, just getting this word out, bringing you know, young new minds to it, working in the communities, and just becoming the next leaders in the movement. So I couldn't be more pleased. OK, there's my love of my life. Where's Chaitana? Do you miss Lily? <laughs> Chaitana um, used to run our uh, global farm animal work. So um, it's great that you're here, Chaitana. And Lily was, uh, she adopted Chaitana. She came into her office almost every morning for treats. So. <laughs> Um, so Lily is uh, an international dog. She is from the island of Trinidad and Tobago, Street Dog, which is another huge program that we work on globally. Um, so as you heard, I became the, uh, was appointed officially the president and CEO of the Maid Society of the US about three weeks ago. I've been acting uh, CEO for about a year and uh, with the organization for 27 years now. So I started like around seven years old, maybe. <laughs> just, just, just getting used to the work. Um, but before I get into some of the, the, the topics, um, you know, I just wanted to, to just raise briefly that uh, Humane Side of the US has gone through a lot of changes this year, um, some quite public. And I think some of you who may have uh, attended Carol's um, talk may have mentioned it. And, um, so for me, um, getting our culture right 
um, making sure things like that never happen again are key and fundamental to, to who I am and the work I want to do. Um, the Humane Side of the U.S. and the HSI, I think, are the most, together, most you know, effective global animal protection organization in the world. And people come to it because they want to be involved in the work. But I also want them to come to our organization because it's the best place to work for animals. And so for me, that has been key. I've done um, a lot of work with our culture, bringing in outside experts, embedding themselves in our organization for almost a year now, um, governance work at our board, and a reconciliation process, truth and reconciliation process for, for um, the women who came forward. So a lot of work that happened this year, work I'm really proud of, work that has not been easy. Um, but it was necessary, and I'm happy to say we did all of that while we continue to have great victories for animals. Um, we are an incredibly mission-driven organization. It is what we do, why we do, and um, sort of brought everything together this year. So, okay. Um, just briefly, because I always have to have a picture of my mom. Um, I, I had the good fortune of being raised by an animal advocate. Um, she really taught me not just to love animals, but to advocate for them. And so, you know, she used to drag me to anti-fur demos and in New York and in town, um, out in front of Wonderland dog track many years ago before it closed, thank goodness. Um, but it really was great to have such a strong role model. And we always had a pack of rescue dogs and some injured birds that we would always um, nurse and bring back to health and release. Um, that's my daughter there. It's a little self-promotion of my family. Um, so that's the next generation advocate. Um, she's actually, this is many years ago, this is when we were in front of the Chinese embassy. Um, and uh, she's actually looking at universities now. But I just showed that picture of my mom and my daughter because um, for me, animal protection is a way of life. It has been in my family. Um, three generations of, of women um, working for this cause and uh, I'm proud of that. So as was mentioned, horse slaughter. Um, when I started at the Legal uh, Investigations Division, my role was really to make sure we were doing the investigations legally. I wanted to do the basic work, uh, eavesdropping, trespass, all these things. And the work that we did, um, looking first at horse slaughter and other issues, I realized that um, this really is something you can't focus on just in one country. And it, really brought it home because the work we did on um, part of this investigation was we got the U.S. slaughter plants shut down through the appropriations, which means that there wasn't any money for the inspections, so they couldn't operate. That didn't shut it down, though. So U.S. horses were then loaded up uh, in, in basically cattle cars, and they went to Mexico and Canada to be slaughtered. And so for me, it really was a wake-up call that um, you don't want to shift the problem. I mean, you certainly need to do important work wherever you are, but you have to be mindful of, of what it means on a global perspective. Are you really ending it? Are you moving it? Are you, are you um, not really tackling the, the root causes of it? So about, um, I guess it was 1995, I started moving into the international space, and HSI had, HSUS had incorporated Humane Society International. And so in the beginning, we were really sure what we were doing with it. We didn't have any operations in any countries. Um, what we really did with it was look at, oh, I'm so, sorry, and I'll get back to dog fighting, but. Can you just your microphone a little bit? the recording. Cool, great. Okay. Nothing about my shirt, just the recording you're worried about messing up? Okay. Um, and so what we did as HSI is we looked at the global uh, international agreements. And so we thought that would be a place where we could really um, get to as many animals to protect in the varying countries around the world. So the first global agreement I worked on was the International Whaling Commission. And in that body, there was about, when I started, about 40 countries. I think there's about 80 plus in there now. But it really looked at measures that um, if the body decided to protect a, uh, an animal, then all the countries, supposedly, um, had to abide by it. So as, as a young lawyer, it was pretty heady to be uh, negotiating with New Zealand or, well, Japan, no one ever negotiated with Japan, oh. um, but some of the other countries and really getting strong measures. And that's when I started working with colleagues from around the globe. 
and seeing them lobby their governments. And I realized that I had influence with these other countries because they got to know us and they knew we could provide the work. But you really had to be from the country to really move your government in the right direction. So that really um, started us thinking about, well, should, how do we expand? How do we really um, affect animal protection in countries? You can't just come in, you can't swoop in. It really has to be homegrown. And there are so many great people doing this work around the world. So it really started us thinking about how do we build capacity with other groups. And CITES, um, I don't know if Nathan, if you've ever been to CITES, but I know IFA has been, is really active in it. Um, CITES, again, is one of these international global bodies where a lot of lawyers and scientists, NGOs um, from around the world come together to, to really focus on protecting certain species um, from a whole host of, of wildlife trade ills. And um, just to see the power when NGOs come together, um, we form something called the Species Survival Network, which again is really harnessing the power of NGOs working around the globe and getting them to focus on issues and lobbying their own governments. And so that's been an incredible um, effort. Uh, and that covers basically you know, all the, the, the wildlife species that are traded internationally. So it's an incredible opportunity, um, especially for lawyers. This kind of work, I mean, it's, it's not something I thought about when I was in law school, but, but this kind of uh, international treaty work is really exciting. It's, it's sort of groundbreaking because you're making these arguments on a, at a global level um, and working with countries equivalent to their state departments and else. And the other nice thing about it is a lot of these delegations, like for CITES, it has 190 plus countries. Um, some of them are really small and they have one or two people uh, in the delegation, so they can't do the work. So if you start working with these countries, you're doing incredible legal work for animals uh, you know, from a position of another country. It's really exciting, and it's something that if people have an opportunity <coughs> ever to go to, um, it's, really, it's really worth it. Jathan, I think you helped me put this map together. <laughs> um, so, we decided we really needed to expand, that uh, more and more there were hardly any issues, the big fights, the big issues, that were wholly um, solvable in any one country. And so rather than um, act like the US is the center of the world, really see where else um, other great organizations were doing work, how could we build capacity with them, um, how can we find out you know, what are the gaps where they, they don't have um, some of the expertise that we have. And so we really started um, a, a hard look at the, the globe, and you can see where we are now. It's really, it's really incredible, the expansion that we've had, and really in the last, I'd say, 12 years is when we've started. And we're part of a, you know, we, I think we have about 10 more countries in the next two years. It was an ambitious program, an, an ambitious plan, working with um, some philanthropy and donors who want to see the work expanded. And when I say that, I, I, we don't really hire any expats. It's really working with the people in the country. And as I said, there are incredible people working on animal issues. And one of the things that, that I just really um, appreciate is that in some countries where we work, there, there isn't uh, an organization where they'd be paid for doing animal work. That doesn't mean they're not doing it. It means they're just doing it in the morning, in the wee hours before they go to work and, before they, and after they come home. And the idea that we start working with them in some of these countries, um, they can't believe you can actually make a profession out of this. And this is what we want to help, and this is how we want to build capacity. Um, you know, we've had so many offices that have just done incredible work. I mean, India, I think, is one of our you know, most successful offices where they have incredible legislative victories through the courts um, on all the issues, on <coughs> factory farming, on cosmetic testing, on so many of these issues. So it's really been fantastic to see this growth and expand it. And um, if you've got people working around the globe on these issues, that's when you start really, really making the lasting and meaningful headway. So farm animals, um, obviously, incredibly important issue and, and great organizations, including my own working on it in this country, uh, confinement, meat reduction, all of these issues, clean meats. Um, 
but the majority of farm animals are outside the U.S., and the majority of suffering is outside the U.S. And so really under Chaitanya's leadership when she worked with us, um, she built that program out uh, in a number of countries and really um, getting people to focus on what are the most extreme uh, issues facing farm animals and having some real great corporate victories and legislative victories. Sorry. Cosmetic testing is another um, really big global issue for us. And here's a case where the US is lagging pretty far behind. Um, there are now, I think, if you include the EU, it's about 38 nations that have banned cosmetic testing on animals. And so we're just hanging out there. Um, we should, this is something that we should have done a long time ago. And legisl legislatively in the US, it's a big priority for us. Um, as for all of you know, there's no reason to be doing it. There are alternatives that are uh, you know, more efficient uh, and not as expensive as animals, and no reason to do this anymore. But I like this issue because we're going nation by nation um, and really trying to, to build a groundswell um, for, we hope to get there for across the world, anyone who's doing it. So this campaign, um, it's one that's really near and dear to my heart and one that I've been working on for, for quite some time. This is our dog meat work. Um, there are about five Asian countries uh, that work, that either raise dogs for food or they're taken off the streets street dogs, community dogs, and, and some dogs that are with collars. And so um, it's something we started about three years ago. And it's, uh, it's, it's gruesome, as many of these issues are. But it's one that um, I like how we've approached it. Uh, we work in country with partners. The, the country I think we're closest to getting a legislative ban on it, probably be three years out, um, is South Korea. South Korea is the only Asian nation that actually raises them, farms them um, for food. And so what we started doing was um, looking at what consumption patterns were, health issues surrounding it. A lot of the, the work we do in, in, in nations is also we try to tie it to human health because if you've got street dog issues, all of these things, rabies is a big issue. And so we try to come in that way. And that's been really helpful. So we started a program in South Korea to work with the dog farmers. And um, what we found, you know, and we could barely, you know, initially not even have a conversation with one. It was pretty challenging. But then you talk to them and you hear that their kids are mortified by what their parents are doing. They don't want to inherit the business. It's the last thing they want. Um, and it's not, it's not a, you know, it's not a prestigious thing to be doing. And so but they don't have any, any alternatives. So what we started was a program of providing them you know, almost literally seed money to get into another line of business. So the first farmer um, closed it out, destroyed all the cages. We took the dogs, and he grew blueberries and became a blueberry farmer. Next one was a chili farmer. One got into water resource. And um, these farmers then became our spokespeople. I mean, they had the most traction with the industry. They have the most traction with the government. It's, it's you know, challenging for us to come in and, and say, this is what you should do. Um, they're saying it. And we have farmers lining up for, for, to get out of the business. Now, we can't shut down every farm. There's about, well, now there's about 16,000. So what we try to do was shut down enough to start this to get the people in Korea. So we, the first farm we shut down, there was no press. I mean, we were taking pictures of each other and the dogs. The next one, a few more. The last one, so I think we're on uh, the 16th farm, there was so much press, not just international press, but Korean press, which is what we are looking for. We want the Korean press because they see the, 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 you know, all the interest in these dogs, a lot of Koreans that we spoke to, South Koreans, they hadn't been to a dog farm. They didn't really understand. They thought dog meat dogs were different than the pet dogs they have in their home. And there is a growing pet population, ownership population in South Korea. So they somehow just put it to the side. So when they actually saw these dogs and the conditions they were raised in, um, it's, it's breaking it open. And we've just done another poll. Um, it's, the consumption is going down. 
Um, the idea of ending it is, is increasing. We've done the economic studies to show that it is not in the interest of these uh, farmers. It's, it's literally a dying industry. It is not making money for them, and the government should help transition them out eventually. So that was a program, and it continues, and it will continue, as I said. We also work on it in China, Vietnam, and Thailand. And again, in these countries, um, having a lot of progress. We have an office now in Vietnam um, to continue this work, and not just on the dog meat trade, but on farm animal uh, issues. We also have an office in South Korea working on this. Um, China, yeah, I don't think anyone's getting an office in China. But there is such an incredibly um, impressive fledgling growing movement um, of folks there. And so for one of our programs, um, we, on, on the dog meat issue, we provide assistance and funding and training so they spot when they see a dog meat truck go by, they can call the police, <coughs> stop it. Now, it's not illegal to, to consume dogs for dog meat. What is illegal is if they're transported without papers. And so there's never been one truck that's packed with dogs has ever had the appropriate paperwork. They're just grabbing them off the streets. So it's really empowered um, the local activists to, to have a role, to be able to do something about it. Um, and so that's been um, really exciting. And as I said, these issues take off when they're homegrown and they have traction in country. Sometimes it's just getting them started um, and giving them some tools and resources to get the work done. We also work on it in Indonesia as well. Um, the other area that uh, is a growing area of work that we do is HSUS has been very strong on disasters as far as coming in and helping with the animals, the transport of the animals, um, the rescue. But we have a global uh, HSI team. And so what I'm looking at going forward is really sort of uniting the work that we do. So we are a global force for disaster work and what that looks like for, for the animals. And again, these types of things that we do, um, the hands-on work, like disasters and the dog meat trade, saving the animals, it's always tied to a policy goal, a legislative goal. So, because you can't just work on these issues without doing that as well. Working on these issues, showing the animals, helping them get out of crisis is what sort of shocks people into moving and gets, raises the awareness more than anything else we could do. Plus, you get to save some great animals, which is incredibly important. So it's, it's really the way of, of you know, working on our hands-on work to support the corporate work we do and the legislative work we do. And it seems to be a really, a really successful model. Let's moving forward slide. So as, as I said at the outset, um, <coughs> In my, in my new role, uh, as having been the HSI president actually for only four months before I got pegged to be <laughs> acting CEO of HSUS, um, is really to unite the work. Um, I do not, again, I do not believe that you can affect any of these big issues without looking at it globally. We are a global community. Commerce is, is nearly instantaneous communications. People are communicating all over the world all the time. And these animals, the industry is in all these other countries, and we need to be. And we need to be as coordinated and as collaborative as we can because, again, these issues are intense and severe, and, and we need everybody operating together and working on them. So that's how I plan to move um, HSUS forward. And as I said at the outset, also doing a lot of good work to really build and support our culture so we are a safe, great place to work for animals. So, thank you. Thank you. So we've got the room for a while, so we'll, we'll maybe take 10 minutes of questions, then take a break for anyone who needs to leave for class, and then continue with questions after that. So if you have a question, please raise your hand until I come to you with the microphone because we are recording. Um, I'm really interested in greyhound adoption, and since um, greyhound racing is ending in this country and in first world countries, lots of greyhounds are being sent to second or third world countries like Argentina or Asia. Um, I know that uh, the HSUS has been helpful with, with dogs in Macau who are, are being adopted out from there. 
Could you talk a little bit about what um, what HSUS is doing for, for, for Greyhounds these days? Sure. Um, a, as you know, the uh, ballot measure uh, in Florida, which just passed the amendment, um, which was so important, it banned uh, Greyhound racing in Florida, which is key because 11 out of the 18 tracks were in Florida. So if you shut down Florida, then it it's makes no sense for the rest of the country and the rest of the states to do it. There's just a handful of states that are doing it. And so um, as far as Florida goes, it was an incredibly successful measure. Um, it's funny, we won that faster than I thought we would. We were in a coalition of groups. We had just left the final polling station. It was around 8.30 p.m. And we were heading over to do the watch, you know, watch the, the results come in. And, um, and we were going to a place, uh, a bar that let greyhounds in, which was really cool. We had all these greyhounds. But as we were driving over, they said, we're going to make the call because it, the numbers were coming in so high. It was so great to see a state that is so steeped in, in, in dog racing. Um, so that was so the U.S. And we're also working with helping place them. We're starting a fund to help with uh, placement for these dogs. And then um, more, and we're also looking at this, the remaining states, what we can do in the remaining states. Uh, globally, we have a HSI Australia and working with them on this issue as well. It's, we're looking at where our country offices are that have Greyhound Racing and see what we can do to sort of, sort of transfer some of the knowledge and how we work to phase it out and end it. So it's an important issue. It's one we're going to see end in, our, in, our, in soon time. So. But, but even now, there are lots of Greyhounds ending up in the meat market in China and in Asia. It, 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 there are. There are dogs that end up in the meat markets in a lot of places. So you work on the issue. To, so they're not, bre they're not breeding them anymore in Florida. So there's not going to be a surplus to be dumped in other places. They're, the breeding has stopped since the, since the measure went in. That's why you have to do both. You have to do the education. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I'm really excited to hear about... Um, the focus that you're going to have on farm animals. Um, and I, my, my question is whether there was any concern um, when deciding to focus on issues like dog meat or horse meat um, or dolphin, like dolphin-free tuna, whether that sort of perpetuates the idea that there are certain animals that are OK to have as meat, like cows and tuna. And um, there are other animals that are worthy of our protection, like horses and dolphins um, and dogs. And I'd love to know also more about um, your vision for doing more um, farm animal work going forward. Sure. Um, if you look at straight suffering and the numbers of animals involved, it's, it's farm animals. There, there's no question. And so that's why it's been, been probably one of the biggest pushes in HSUS when we started looking at globally the issues we take on, that was one of the, the main ones that we led with. Um, I don't think it sends a message. If you work on these issues and you work on um, try to keep animals from becoming food, if, it's, if it hasn't happened yet, if it's on the cusp, if you can keep certain animals out while you're still working on the animals that are part, they have been part of the food chain to get that out, I see these as complementary. I, I don't ever want to, um, you know, by saying um, you're working on one animal to save one, it doesn't mean that the other ones shouldn't be or that it's right to. And the dog meat farming in South Korea has raised lots of issues for people about farmed animals because these dogs in South Korea are farmed under horrendous conditions and slaughtered under even worse conditions. People who are outraged about that starting to make the connection. So where we can show that um, animals are animals and it's important to address it. Um, I don't think working on these other issues is sort of legitimizes the others. I think it actually gets to it in a, in a way that brings people in and then just keeps exposing them to, to what else they need to do. Uh, so thank you on your presentation about presenting a global strategy for um, coupling the action you're doing in protecting animals on the ground to corporate and policy strategy. Um, I, it made me very curious what Humane Society US and International, um, if anything, are planning to do moving forward about addressing climate change, which truly is uh, a global issue um, affecting 
domestic animals in disaster areas, farm animals prone to heat, exhaustion, and extreme weather, and all wildlife from the tropics to the poles. Yeah, don't stop there. Keep, oh, yeah, keep no. going. <laughs> you, can, you can take the mic. And so uh, many of you know John Lovern. I'm sure you do. He, is, he has been an incredible advocate and, and outspoken person on this issue. Um, yes, it is. It looms so large, and it is going to impact all the animals we, we work to protect and ourselves. Um, we have... We have worked on it, been involved in the, the COPS, COPS, trying to get other environmental groups to look at meat reduction um, as one of the key things you can do now. I mean, there's so much we can't reverse. There's so much that takes, but there are things you could do right now. It's not an easy space for animal groups to enter. Um, they're seen as having an agenda, um, but so what? Because it's actually legitimate. Um, it, it's something we've, we've worked on, and actually it was uh, Chaitanya's department that really started that work. Um, and we've certainly tied it to um, one of the ills of factory farming. I mean, not only is it incredibly inhumane, it's cut pollution and, and water quality and contributes to, to climate change. So we use it as a factor in it. Um, it, it, needs, it needs a bigger platform. And um, it's something certainly we've talked about, but uh, we've got to get the other environmental groups really in, you know, involved in this because this is something that they do lead with. And if they can bring that animal component in, um, it'll help. And we're certainly standing available to do that. Can you, um, can you talk, a, right here, oh, sorry. that's all right. Can you talk a little bit about some of your farm animal protection work? Like I was really blown away by your success in Massachusetts and then the same evening you won Greyhound Racing, you also won the just Watershed California Ballot Initiative. Like what is, like how are you thinking about farm animal protection in the overall context of HSUS? What's next? And then on South Korea, you said you have a farm animal program um, in mm -hmm. South Korea beyond the dogs. Like how do you think about that issue internationally? Sure. So sort of um, three part. Well, first off, I mean, confinement, uh, getting animals out of constraint, uh, farm animals out of constraint, con con blah, 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 confinement, um, has been, was one of the, the first things that we worked on. And um, getting them out of gestation crates and, and, and hens out of uh, battery cages and so on. And then we expanded that globally. Um, and so sort of going uh, country by country working on that issue. And in India, um, working on it through the courts, actually getting it banned through the courts, the battery cage issue. Um, and then also meat reduction um, here in the US, the, that work, and then also globally. Um, I think Chaitanya started one even in Africa. Um, and we have one program in the UK, and we have one in Canada. Um, they've really taken off. So it's looking at reduction. It's looking at ending uh, extreme confinement. And also um, looking at... Uh, Broiler chickens is another area that we've, go, we've started moving into um, and really trying to just hit that in as hard as we can. Um, so we tend to do these programs, these, the similar type of program globally. And South Korea, um, when we open an office, there's always something that we came in on. So in South Korea, we came in on the dog meat issue. So that's the biggest issue. But we're also looking at what we can do for wildlife because we just got our office incorporated and who else we can bring on. And then what are the farm animal issues there that we could have traction on? Um, the other the work that we've done for farm animals and internationally is really looking at the banks. So the World Banks, they fund a lot of this. And so really getting in, trying to work with them, um, trying to show why this is really not sustainable, viable, and it doesn't really help the people in those, in those places where um, they talk about how great this is going to be if they get a huge factory farm in and they get funding. So it's really looking at a lot of different components of that and continuing that work. Um, so the ballot measure in California, that was phenomenal. It really was one of the strongest measures everywhere. And so we're looking to see how we can um, reproduce that in other states maybe without a ballot measure, because those are, those are tough and expensive. Um, but get enough momentum, now look at more of it just legislatively if we can do it that way. Could you flip back to your globe, your, your map of the world? Would that be difficult? If it is, I apologize. But no, I'm getting there. there. That'll help. There you go. So, oh, yeah, oh. go back one more. 
So I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the strategy for being really the biggest global organization. Um, you know, looking around at where the offices are and where the, the reach is, you have offices with tremendous amounts of additional regional coverage. Um, gaps in you know, the Middle East is the, is the gap that stands out the most. To me, you have Australia, which has a strong uh, local animal protection uh, movement. So I'm wondering, is there, are, are you going for an overarching theme, or is it more about targeted opportunities, whether or not it's a well-established uh, country or a, a country with no one else, where in India you are the biggest organization or the most effective one, as, as far as I can tell? Uh, in India, what's the strategy, uh, and is it something that can be articulated, or it's it's still <laughs> in the works? Because I know I know you realized that you had just taken over HSI not not long before you take up took over. Right. HSI no, I was well, working so. in HSI, so I was part of the problem part of, of where we ended up. Um, yeah. No, I didn't say it was a problem, but it just it's it's you are the international mm -hmm. organization. So how you choose to deploy your resources has effects, uh, you know, trickle-down effects, sure. effects to other smaller organizations. So I was curious what the philosophy sure. or strategy is. So it's an evolving one. Um, I'd say in the early days, when I first started and moved over to the HSI side, we had uh, Canada and the UK, and they really were just more fundraising offices than any program. Um, and then being young and scrappy and not sure what... Um, made the most sense. We started working with a lot of different people, building capacity through these international meetings. And it really was um, sort of finding these people in country that was a lot of it. Um, because if you knew you had someone really good that you'd met, and if you just invested in them and helped them, um, they could really take off. And so it was a little bit of that. It was a little bit of the country itself. Like, is this, is there just a huge gap? Nobody's there. Um, is it one of the areas that has like the most uh, factory farms or whatever it is? So we started really honing in on what made the most sense for us. And now what we're doing, um, which I think makes the most strategic sense, is we have uh, offices that we've incorporated in certain regions and then do work around it so that country office like India could be the hub for... Um, you know, Sri Lanka and the street dog work we're doing in Nepal and Bangladesh and all of these other things. So trying to build areas where they can support each other. It's not perfect. Um, it's, it's still, there are a lot of gaps and you mentioned the Middle East. That's, uh, that's an issue. That is a hard place to do work for animals. Um, China is you know, one of those, but we've, we found our footing in China through our partners. We will not incorporate there. It doesn't make any sense but it makes sense to support the fledgling animal protection movement. Um, we're looking for, for openings in that area um, in the Middle East, but if, it's hard to, to say, but sometimes if it's just not ripe, you could spend all your time just trying to open the office and not really advancing the animal issues. So when we look at a country, we also look at what are their human rights uh, laws? What are the other, because animals, Animal protection is sort of caught up in that. And, and so if they don't recognize even the most basic, it's very hard to get work done. But that doesn't mean we don't have some partners um, that we do try to support from time to time, but we have not, we have not moved into the, to the Middle East yet. Do you do any work with ocean animals besides dolphins and whales? Because overfishing can, is a huge problem in some areas, and it's something I feel very strong about. Well, I'm glad you do. Can't wait to see you later when you want to want to sign up for a job with this. Um, yes, uh, overfishing it's 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 extreme in so many areas. I mean, they fished out the oceans in in so much of the world. Um, so we have worked more on the species: um, turtles, whales, dolphins, <coughs> sharks, um, as sort of the way to galvanize people around it. But um, the, we've also worked on the fishing method, the long liners, the trawlers. And the pathetic thing is, a lot of these countries, because of the strength of their fishing industry, they are blaming the marine mammals for wiping out the fish, the fish that they compete with for food. So we have a double problem that we have to work on, and we do work on that issue. But you're absolutely right. Overfishing is, is just... Um, 
huge problem. People have to wake up to it and understand it. And uh, the health of our oceans and the fish in the end, it's so vital to the survival of all of us. Okay, we'll take a quick break. If anyone needs to leave for a class, we'll give you a minute or two to do so while I walk over to our next question. Sure, yeah, it's not done. We're just giving folks time to go to the morning to spread for class. Oh, yes. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, we're going to keep going on with the questions if uh, folks are telling us. All right, so we've got our next question here. So, um, thank you for the um, noble work you've done. Um, I don't know if I heard wrong, but talking about animal agriculture, I, I, I thought you might have said that we have some of the the better systems compared to other places in the world, and, and I am aware of the, you know, the ag-gag laws. Is my thought, I thought that Europe and the EU had better, more progressive systems, so I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. And just on the side, your, your philosophy about, um, you know, stores like Whole Foods kind of lulling people into thinking that this is humane, happy meat, and it, might that be counterproductive? Because then people kind of think, you know, um, less with their conscience. Um, so thank you for pointing that out, and I hope that wasn't what I meant. No, our systems are not more humane. Um, I was saying the majority of farm animals that need help are outside the U.S., and there are many countries that have much more humane systems, the EU, for instance, um, and some of the other countries we work in. The U.S. is, there is a strong agriculture <laughs> lobby here, um, and so there's so much work that continues to, to be done. It actually is the corporations, the corporate work that is leading it, not the legislators here. Um, state by state, we have more of, of, of an ability. Federally, it's really hard. Um, and your question about uh, Whole Foods um, and their GAP standards, I do think um, it's important for there always to be an effort to move to protect farm animals and, and alleviate their suffering. I think that is just an incredibly important thing to do um, and never stop trying to do that. I also think it's incredibly important to, to do the work of um, reducing meat consumption. And, I, and you know, I don't think we'll get to the day where the world will be free of meat. So what do we do for the animals that are caught up in these systems. And that's why I'm really comfortable working on the issues of getting them out of confinement and, and doing these things. And so corporations, you know, it's, I don't know if it, um, I, I think it's a good thing when corporate, corporations try to do the right thing. Greenwashing obviously is a different issue, but if they have put some serious work into it, um, and I, you know, I think originally the GAP standards um, did uh, I'm not sure how effective it is now. I think it's still working on that as there's been changes at Whole Foods. But I think it's important to keep moving in the direction of, of alleviating the suffering of these animals. Hi, um, thank you for the, the talk. You mentioned cosmetic testing and I'm wondering if you can expand in, on your vision and any strategies that you may have going forward on tackling other issues in animal experimentation, so beyond cosmetic testing. Sure. Um, well, I mean, cosmetic testing is, is the low-hanging fruit. I mean, that is, it's very hard for people, other than the U.S. legislature to, and, and corporations, to defend that. Um, pesticides and keep moving. Um, you're, not gonna get, you're not gonna get it all at once, so just keep moving it as, as far along as you can. And hearing some of the work that you all are doing, I guess upstairs and, and the focus of the round table that you've had, I think that's fascinating, and I don't know if you want to mention that, but it is a Tomorrow really... Tomorrow at 12. 
Tomorrow at 12. It's a really exciting idea about um, how to really tackle this, and I, I, I'm really pleased to hear you guys are working on that because it takes a lot of you know, great minds and good strategies to, to do this. So. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my question is uh, back to um, talking about the species-specific uh, meat bans. Um, the question is whether there's any evidence for or against in a, like a sort of substitution effect where if you um, say today this country you know, say can't eat dog meat, does that just lead to more consumption of other species to fill the gap, for example? Or, uh, or is that just not the case? I, I'm just curious what you may or may not uh, sure. know about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So in that case, we, we do know. And just so um, when we transition dog farmers out of uh, raising dogs for food, they don't go into any kind of animal agriculture. That is absolutely a non-starter for us. It has to be something humane, crop growing or something else. Um, in the case of in South Korea and in most countries that we've looked at for dog meat, it's not a main staple. It's um, in South Korea, it's bacnel. It's during a couple summer months um, because they think it helps people not be so hot in the summer. It's like some crazy myths around this stuff. So it's not shifting it. Um, again, I you know that is. You don't want to compound a problem. You want to try to address them. So we do try to look at these things hol holistically. It's not a mainstay. It's something that's ripe for movement. Um, if we can continue to try to get these animals out of the food chain, that's great. I don't want to put burdens on other animals. But so far, the work we've done, we don't see that. And you know, I, I, I wouldn't want that to ever be a, an argument to not work on any of them. I think you just have to keep looking at it holistically and how much can you continue to do to keep moving it and moving the issues. When people start looking at what they're eating and if they think about it at all, they start thinking about it more broadly. Um, and so for me, I think that's really the way to get to a lot of people who would never have gotten there on the farm issue, farm animal issue before, maybe. And my understanding on some of the crossovers is that with California's first ballot initiative, Prop 2, the single, the exit polling showed that the single biggest correlative factor whether someone would vote yes on Prop 2 was pet ownership. So it does show exactly. that there is some crossover. Dogs are the gateway drug animal. They really are. They get us in. Hi, Kitty. I have two questions, if I may. Um, the first one goes back to that map, and I'm just wondering, um, being a US incorporated organization, how much is that a barrier in working um, globally with other countries that have issues going on because specifically in the Middle East and I think I've talked to you before I don't know if you remember I'm from Iran yeah. and um, it's ready to go people are you know the movement's starting but there are no relationships between US and Iran so human society clearly can have a presence there but you know the US has great relationship with Saudi Arabia but culturally they may not be where they so uh, I mean that's just the Middle East but around the world, globe in the issues that you work with, do you necessarily have to look at, um, do we have an embassy there? Do we have good relationships with their government? And if not, how do you get across that barrier? Sure, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so when I say we expanded, we incorporate in these countries and we don't have expats running these offices. There are people from, from the country working on these issues. So we are, um, you know, HSI India, we are HSI South Korea. It's not Humane Society of the U.S. This was something that was incredibly important to me. Um, this is not the U.S. going in and, and dictating. So we do incorporate under the laws of the country. Um, and so to go into a country where there are not good relations, it's really hard as a U.S.-based NGO, because I'm the, you know, the one in the past who had done all the legal work, hired the firms. If we, I can't even fly over there legally um, it's, it's, it's challenging. So whether or not the U.S. has relations is, is one factor. Um, you know, my, the way the offices are set up, HSUS is still, and HSI, it's incorporated, that particular is incorporated in the U.S., really are still the motherships. But the, 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 the goal is really to have these country offices become the national organizations of their country. And then once that sort of takes off more, then there may be more cross work. And I'm you know, really trying to unite these, these countries because again, everything's so US focused, as you said, doesn't always help. And a lot of times it can hurt. 
um, you know, depending on our administration or depending on the issues, it might be a barrier sometimes. So you're absolutely right. And my second question is, how do you um, how do you tackle the cultural sensitivities of issues like um, um, like for example in China now the demand for donkey skin is so high, or the bullfighting in Mexico or Spain or even the rodeo in Texas, um, the things that are so ingrained in the culture. How do you um, sure. <laughs> I think that, um, so I don't take that for an answer, because if we did, we could never advance any of the issues. I mean, everything has a history. The US was the biggest whaling nation um, in, in their heyday. And so traditions, it changes. Um, and it is something that, uh, and, and Gus Kenworthy, who's an Olympic skier, who was with us in South Korea, said, he got asked that question, and I love his line. He said, you know, he was in the dog meat farm, and he looked around, and he said, this is, this is cruelty. This is cruelty. You can call it culture, but it's cruelty. And so we don't go in and name and shame. We don't come in and say you're evil for doing this. We just show that this is, in fact, incredibly cruel. It's not necessary. It's not how you want to be um, seen or, or be a part of. And it changes. I mean, Mexico fight, bull fighting in Mexico, we're getting close to getting that, you know, moving along through, through and Mexico City, it's banned. I mean, we, we're, we're making these, these incredible strides. So it's evolving. And I think as long as you don't come in and attack and say you're evil for doing it, because there's so many things in the U.S. that, that are pretty damn bad, um, work with them. And I, and I really don't see it as a barrier. I really see it as sort of an evolving ethos towards animals. We've talked a lot about companion animals and farm animals. I'm wondering what HSUS's plans are for wild animals, both nationally and internationally, especially as you know more species are going extinct. And here in the U.S., there's a lot of um, these populations for big cats, especially, are not regulated. Properly. Sure, we're working on that. Got introduced yesterday, the Big Cat um, Public Protection Act, Public Safety Act. Um, so HSUS and HSI have vibrant uh, wildlife programs. And so the big issues they work on is the wildlife trafficking, um, and that's a lot through the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Um, in the in individual countries, uh, we work on that in the U.S. Um, we have a wildlife department in the U.S. Um, on a lot of the species. Our litigation, APL, animal protection litigation, has just been on the defense for the last couple of years in this administration just holding the line on one rollback after another on wildlife. Go, we're, we're in there on the trophy hunting issue, in there and fighting in any, any trying to roll back on the Endangered Species Act. Um, it's really an area that I think legislative, um, sorry, lit litigation-wise, we've done exceedingly well this year because we don't have a favorable administration. I mean, wildlife is such a target in this administration. And trophy hunters, the Safari Club International, they really have a seat at the table, and, and, and so it's really been tough, but we've, we've, we've held the line on this, and we'll continue to do that. Um, wildlife trafficking is, is an incredibly um, pervasive issue, uh, the elephants, the rhinos, and we all of these issues, and so we tackle it at the global level um, in the U.S., and of course through our country offices supporting and working together on that, but, um, and climate change obviously is a huge issue, so that people have to make that connection more strongly as well. It is so wonderful to hear about the changes that you've been making at HSUS. This makes a huge difference. Um, and, but what you've been talking about, there are so many things. One, anything about habitat, because <coughs> even if it's benign, uh, the, the loss of, of their, their homes is affecting Gorillas, orangutan, uh, on a, uh, Jane Goodall talks about how the gombe is just shrinking and there's now becoming a lot of negative chimp-human interaction, uh, which gets a lot of headlines, but the, it's, it's inevitable. I, so I'd like to ask about habitat. I'd like to ask about um, the trade in exotic birds 
And also just to say how eye-opening it is that the fishermen are actually targeting marine mammals saying that they're the problem. 90% of, of all of the fish in the sea we learned a couple of weeks ago is now gone. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, boy, that was depressing. <laughs> um, so uh, habitat protection is incredibly important. Um, it's not, it's something HSUS has, has done. We have a Humane Society a Wildlife Land Trust where we have several hundred properties. And what's unique as compared to the Nature Conservancy, say, is that we don't allow any hunting or trapping on the land. Um, so it's a program that we have. It's been going on for about 20 years. I, I think what makes, well, you know, we have all those properties and we'll continue to, to caretake all those properties. But I think what would be more effective is really trying to work with the existing habitat protection organizations and really work with them on, on you know, trying to protect land, uh, the animals on the land. And so that's something that we're talking a lot about is it, does it make sense for us to continue to be landholders as an animal protection organization working on you know, the big issues? Um, can we be an advocate with the other uh, land preservationist organizations? And it's starting. There's, there's more and more organizations at the state level that are, are not allowing hunting or trapping to be part of you know, having an easement in that. So it is important. Um, and I, you know, we really need organizations to do this to step up. Um, sorry, I don't know why this is so. So your next question was um, birds, the the traffic. So we um, we work on this. If it's the sort of the global trade in these animals, um, that's something that we have been working on along with any of the other species that are traded. Um, and we try to get them protections through the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, which will put these animals on different protection lists. And so um, birds are highly migratory. It takes, if you're talk, talking about the work, it has to be really na national and global. And so that's what mainly we try to do it through that international body. Uh, would you call it? Um, I assume that a lot of the internet, the, the foreign uh, factory farm meat winds up in um, in the fast food industry in places like Costco. Um, is that true? And also, I was wondering, does the United States actually have more factory farms than foreign people do? But you just don't, you just aren't able to prosecute them. And um, which McCall? And the other thing was. Um, like I just found out that uh, India is expelling its indigenous people to save its forests. So I was wondering whether the whole um, farm, the whole um, animal issue was, um, you, you had mentioned that you were working with, with uh, indigenous people and people, but like India is working against the human population. In some places, um, fascist governments, like I expect Bolsonaro to cut down the rainforest and the, the um, palm oil and cocoa and stuff like that cuts down the rainforest. And I'm just wondering on both ends whether you can, um, whether you're looking at this in, in, I'm sure you're trying to do a holistic thing, but you're aware that that all these things are impacting, like habitat. Sure. Um, just uh, a lot of these issues are all connected. Um, that's why I think it's key that animal protection issues try to work as closely as they can with environmental issues. And human rights issues um, do directly impact on animal protection issues. And so, for me, it's, it's not just about uniting our work and making us a global organization. The more we can, we, can, we can have alliances with these other groups and not be at odds with each other, or um, then that's really the only way to tackle all the things that you're talking about. But you're absolutely right. One last question over here. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation and your work. 
Um, I'm wondering about youth education as a strategy. Uh, it's been really successful with wildlife trafficking and poaching and the meat, the dog and meat industry. Wondering if that could be applied to the U.S. and farmed animals and. Yeah. Sure, um, it, it's a good question. It's um, we have been involved in humane education and some of the laws that we work on uh, in other countries, for instance, in Guatemala, we got the first animal protection law, federal animal protection law, in that we also got mandated humane education for elementary schools. And so to us, that's a really um, exciting way to start just you know getting at the, the children, which obviously it just keeps gaining in, in benefits. Um, we haven't really focused on humane education as far as farm animals in the U.S. The work has been really more corporate uh, driven, but um, it's an interesting it's an interesting concept, and I think that um, it's more and more in the media, more and more in the press, um, and especially as you have these big ballot measures. So it, it's an interesting it's an interesting idea. So it's super impressive. I mean, obviously it's a whole big world, but it's also a very big organization, and it's remarkable of your ability to keep tabs and know and speak so cogently on all these different issues. So, um, again, on behalf of Harvard Law School and the rest of us, please join me in thanking Kitty.